All right, good evening, good people. Welcome. Welcome colleagues, students, Tucker team alums, affiliated scholars, family, newcomers, and friends of the Tucker Center from around the world. I'm Dr. Nicole Lavoie. I am the director of the Tucker Center for research on girls and women in sport housed in the College of Education and Human Development in the School of Kinesiology at the University of Minnesota. To begin, we acknowledge the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. As people residing on this land, we also acknowledge that it was cared for and called home by the Anishinaabe, Chippewa, Ojibwe, Dakota, and other native peoples. On behalf of the Tucker team, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our fall distinguished lecture. The Tucker Center, as some of you know, and maybe some of you don't, was established in 1993 as the first interdisciplinary research center solely dedicated to the study of girls and women in sport. Over the last 30 years, through research, education, and outreach, we have led a global effort to accelerate systems change for girls and women in sport and physical activity. As I mentioned, the Tucker Center is housed within the School of Kinesiology and the College of Education and Human Development. So I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the director of our School of Kinesiology, Dr. Beth Lewis, the Dean of our college, Dr. Michael Rodriguez, and President of the University of Minnesota, Joan Gable, for their ongoing support of the Tucker Center. Thank you, all of you, for watching this webinar, who also support our work, and use what we produce to create social good in your own communities. A special thanks to the Tucker team. Behind the scenes, as you know, any good work does not happen alone. So a special shout out to my Assistant Director of Research and Programming, Dr. Courtney Boucher, Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow, Dr. Anna Posberg, and our doctoral students, Afrat Abadi and Anna Gorovich. I cannot do what I do without all of you. So thank you so very much. This distinguished lecture brings together all parts of our mission, research, education, and outreach by creating a forum that allows the best and the brightest to share their insights, knowledge, and expertise on a variety of aspects of women's involvement of sport and physical activity. And tonight's panel is no exception. This distinguished lecture series is a special place where once a year, we create a public space and build community for those who care deeply about girls and women in sport. We, dis we discuss current, relevant, and pressing issues from multiple and divergent and complementary perspectives. This lecture is a unique time where we get to be in conversation with each other, not only with the panelists tonight, but together with you. So for the next hour, I know you're all in busy worlds. We don't create the space often enough. So I invite you to be present and create space for yourself to be here with us. And when you have questions, please put them in the Q&A function on Zoom. Tonight, we are going to look back and look forward to pertaining to issues facing women in collegiate sport in the United States. In the 50 years after the passing of Title IX, the 1972 Civil Rights Law, the landscape of intercollegiate athletics for women has changed dramatically. This panel of multidisciplinary scholars will discuss the accomplishments of Title IX, as well as the injustices, the unevenness, and the structural inequalities that persist. And we're going to end with what might the next 50 years look like for women in collegiate athletics? As those of you who follow women's sport or study the intersection of gender and sport, you know that trans athlete inclusion is a hot topic and top of mind for many for a variety of reasons. And tonight our panelists may speak to that from their own areas of expertise, 
but we're not treating trans inclusion as a standalone topic, but as one issue in the broader system. Each panelist, the structure for tonight, each panelist will begin with three to five minutes of prepared remarks that will set the context for her perspective, discipline, and expertise. And after their initial comments, we'll have a discussion together, and then we'll end with a question and answer from the audience. So please do put your questions within the Q&A. So with that, I get to introduce my colleagues. And we're not going to read the full bio because they are very accomplished women. And I don't wanna take away time from hearing their insight. So I would invite you to go at tuckercenter.org and you can read their full bio. But what we'll do here is I will introduce them briefly and I'll use their formal titles and likely from then forward, we'll refer to each other by our first names because we'll be in conversation with one another. Okay, so we're going to start alphabetically and I will introduce each panelist. And if all the panelists can come off video and audio mute, if you will, and join me on screen, welcome. I'll introduce each of you alphabetically and the question for you to say hello to the Zoom crowd is in two words, describe the state of women in college sport right now. Any two words, no judgment, no right or wrong. I have mine, I'll share mine at the end. And those of you listening along, maybe you can think about what your two words are. And if you want, don't put it in the Q&A, but maybe tweet it to us at Tucker Center and tell us what's on your mind. So first up, Dean Aaron Vesuvis, she, her pronouns, is an associate dean and professor of law at Western New England University in Springfield, Massachusetts, who will bring to the panel her legal lens and expertise around Title IX, gender and discrimination in sports. Welcome, Erin. What are your two words? Thanks, Nicole. Uh, in light of today's current events, my two words are free Brittany. Thank you. Uh, next up, Dr. Victoria Jackson, she, her pronouns, is a sports historian at Arizona State University, currently enjoying some nice fall weather, who will bring a perspective of how sports systems can be inclusive, equitable, and just. Victoria, what are your two words? Well, first, on behalf of the city of Phoenix and where I am, thank you, Erin. That was amazing. Um, my two words are, can I swear? Actually, I should have asked that earlier. Hey, fixing I don't have shit. a beep button, so have at it. <laughs> okay, fixing shit. Okay, okay, Zoom crowd, we're, we're setting the tone early and I'm already excited. Okay, uh, next up, Dr. Ajani A.J. Keaton, she, her pronouns, is an assistant professor of health and sports sciences at the University of Louisville and her perspectives on how the intersection of race and gender shapes organizational structures and norms and inequities will likely be her focus. AJ, what are your two words? I guess you got to roll the wool, wool, wool. I, I really tried. <laughs> <laughs> the best I got. But this is why I'm excited. The first two were awesome. Mine is going to be applying pressure. Thank you for that. Next up, Dr. Elizabeth Libby Shero, a, a fellow Gopher alum, welcoming back to the screen. Um, they, her pronouns, is an associate professor of public policy and history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. So we have Massachusetts well represented tonight. Um, they specialize in the gendered politics of public policy, political history of Title IX, and how policy has shaped intersectional meanings of identities. Libby, two words from you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And hello, Minneapolis. Um, I miss you dearly. Um, my two words uh, around uh, uh, women in sport right now are equality unfulfilled. Thank you. And last but not least, but last in the alphabetical order of this particular prestigious panel is Dr. Dr. Aaron Whiteside. She is an associate professor of journalism and electronic media at the University of Tennessee. Go Vols. 
Um, her research uses a feminist approach to understand coverage of women's sport and the intersections of media practices and Title IX. Welcome, Erin, and your two words. Thank you so much for having me. My two words are a seductive party. Ooh, I like it, thank you. Um, my words I, will be paradoxical. I think it's an exciting time and it's also a frustrating time. And I think we'll unpack all our words as we go along tonight. So I will ask um, what we're going to do now is each panelist will start with some introductory comments. And we're going to start with um, Dr. Shero, who will lay the groundwork around what is Title IX, how can we understand it? Because we, as a, as a panel, we're thinking that not maybe everybody starts from an understanding of Title IX, it's, a, it's important. So Dr. Cheryl will start us off and all the other panelists will go on video mute. Dr. Cheryl, take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Hopefully you can uh, see these and hear me as well. Um, so I'm coming at this right as a uh, trained policy scholar. My PhD is actually in political science from the University of Minnesota. And I'm gonna focus um, today on the politics and impacts of public policy. Here at the 50th anniversary, you know, we wanted to start from this place because although I'm sure there's lots of folks on this call tonight who are very focused on gender equity in sport and know a good deal about Title IX, there's actually a great deal of evidence that knowledge about Title IX, um, what it does and does not stipulate, is actually surprisingly low um, among the American public. So I want to get us started here with about a five-minute primer to bring us all into a shared conversation. Um, one thing that I really like to foreground when we talk and think about Title IX is that Title IX is a piece of civil rights legislation. It's indebted, therefore, to the language and activism of the Black civil rights struggle and to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But Title IX is, of course, aimed specifically at education institutions at all levels, and it established in law the very notion of sex discrimination in education itself. Um, there's some excellent legislative histories for any history buffs in the room that have been published recently, written about the pathway to pass educational equity legislation that I'd highly recommend. The one on the slide was actually written by the daughter of Patsy Mink, who is one of Title IX's um, legislative stalwarts. So I would highly recommend that book, um, among others. But in its application, right, the, these histories of legislative passive have rendered what has really become a sweeping public policy intervention under Title IX that has dramatically changed the functioning of higher education, um, changing conditions for students and for faculty. And it only came to address sports in the period after it was signed into law. Of course, Folks are probably also familiar with the other um, scope of the law. It has changed our understanding and debates about addressing sexual harassment and campus sexual misconduct. Um, but in the main, Title IX's policy interpretation and implementation have required policymakers, activists, campus leaders, primary and secondary school leadership to really thoroughly investigate their practices in classrooms, on sports teams, and across campus to ensure that they're addressing any evidence of sex-based exclusion in education. And that sort of raises these questions. Okay, so we have this law, what do we know about the impacts of policy? And if we look to that question in a sort of change over time perspective and focus specifically on the realm of college athletics, there are several important trends. I think the most dominant story that circulates in public discourse around Title IX itself is that it has required colleges and universities to do um, precisely what this trend line illustrates. Um, before Title IX, uh, colleges, universities, American high schools had long-standing practices of financing and supporting athletic teams for boys and men, and Title IX required them to affirmatively build similar programming for athletic teams, um, specifically for girls and women. And of course, right, the timeline demonstrates something about the impacts here. At the college level, American women now have about 12 times as many athletic opportunities as they had before Title IX. This came through a, a process of significant policy negotiation that we've revisited multiple times. There's a huge political story right at the at the core um, and that is sort of haunting these trend line numbers. Uh, but if I showed you similar trends at the high school level, you'd see something um, something quite the same. About only one in 12 girls had opportunities to play sports before Title IX. And today it's one out of every two. 
In addition to those athletic participation trends, social scientists um, identify all sorts of spillover effects on women's workplace involvement, educational attainment, improved long life health, um, and confidence and self esteem. So this is all to say that largely what we think we know about Title IX is that it changed American education and school sponsored athletics, um, and in doing so has undoubtedly reshaped the lives of Americans and American society. But Right. I've also uh, built a career, as have others on this call, uh, on interrogating some of these dominant stories um, in the hopes that we can ensure that policymakers in the next 50 years, even in the next five years, um, can be in engaged in processes that craft equity policies in the best ways to support and benefit the most girls and women. And unfortunately, if we take a really clear-eyed assessment um, of Title IX, what we find is that we are a long way from a full equality. As women's opportunities have grown, so too have men's. And when we consider those in tandem, I think it's really crucial that we ask, right, if that story that we think we know about Title IX, if Title IX has been as, as successful as, as we like to tell ourselves it has been um, in some of those most stirring stories, why don't these two lines yet converge? There's a lot of evidence that the American public is highly supportive of equality of opportunity, right? You can, there's a ton of public opinion data that has been published in public facing forums in the last year um, that support this notion, but we're, we're really far from that vision. And especially when we get into some of the details here, right? When we consider things like athletic scholarship dollars and expenditures on athletics more generally, we're just a long way um, from women um, experiencing equality of experience. And this, I think, raises important questions around why this is the case. Um, and in short, we can think about a lot of the actual qualities of policy itself. And Erin's going to give us some more insight into this, I think, in her comments as well. But among the things um, that I argue and that I really want to point out tonight is that there are some major inadequacies that are very much baked into policy itself. Right? Equal spending, by, uh, as first and foremost, is not required under Title IX. And the spending imbalances are really glaring. Among the largest Division I programs, men enjoy an average of $21.5 million per year at each university. Cumulatively, that means that among NCAA Division I FBS programs, these disparities favor additional spending on men's athletics at over $3.1 billion annually. Women are also dramatically underrepresented in athletic leadership, um, whereas before Title IX, about 90% of coaching opportunities for women's teams were held by women. Today, that number is only about 27% at the college level. And the numbers among the highest levels of leadership are even more dire. So for all that Title IX has done to change opportunity, it's done virtually nothing to improve women's status in leadership. And there's a lot of career opportunities that are really foregone. Furthermore, if we look under the hood about who has been granted athletic opportunities, the intersectional story of policy is extraordinarily biased towards white, middle to upper class, able-bodied, and largely cisgender girls and women. So as much as Title IX has done to disrupt elements of the American gendered order, it has really left the American racial order, which is of course premised on racialized hierarchies, it's left those largely untouched. So, I'm sure, right, as we are thinking tonight uh, about all of this context, there are a host of ongoing issues that we can get into. Enforcement is a major concern, um, but it's not the only one, right? There are political uh, issues that are emerging sort of as we speak and that have been over the last few years um, that are using sports uh, for tactics that have long been a target of the political right um, to, uh, to advance trans discrimination or using sports as a venue to do that. I mean, this is in part due to the context that surrounds sports, right? There, we also know that there is a lack of federal protection on other elements of non-discrimination policy, right? So Title IX in its um, interpretation as such does not yet apply um, uh, full-throatedly anyway to gender identity and sexual orientation non-discrimination protections as well. And so this raises some really serious questions um, about the basic functions of policy design. And uh, my research, uh, I can talk more about this as we go on here, has really focused significantly at examining um, some of the ways in which policy design, I think, is really underperforming for women's interests. Um, so the use of sex segregated sports to pursue equality is a really difficult double bind for women, right? It, I think, presents some um, troubling inability of women to form policy coalitions with men. They spend very little time together. 
together. Um, and I have a forthcoming book that's all about the ways in which uh, policy and its implementation is really preventing things um, in the way that we might like to see them in a more equal future. So the upshot of this um, that, that I would like to sort of lay the groundwork for us today is that I think we really have to return to some fundamental questions about how we push for equality, on what terms, if we want the next 50 years to take us further than the last. So I will um, conclude there. I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Dr. Victoria Jackson. My goodness, Libby, thank you so much for laying that historical and policy foundation. Um, that's really going to set the tone for all of us. So I appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I am going to talk about the current moment uh, a bit more and bring in a historical analysis from there. The morning after the 50th anniversary of Title IX, a day when many of us were participating in celebrations and tributes of many forms, the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, ending nearly a half century of precedent and the right to abortion. The whiplash felt cruel and intentionally so. We here today are here today to reflect on this anniversary and also talk about the current landscape in women's college sports. And one thing we absolutely cannot neglect to do is have a conversation about the effects of the Dobbs opinion on college sports. Just as the passage of Title IX and the battles over regulations, how to put law into practice, were a political process, so too has been and will continue to be the processes through which we work to codify federal abortion rights. We, all of us, we have an opportunity in this moment to show the athletes and young people we work with how the right to play sports is political, how playing sports is political, both in that ideas about bodies and ideas about power play out on the bodies of athletes, and also in that playing sports has never been nor will ever be politically neutral. Attending to the political inherent in sport does not mean that we treat sport as partisan, though approaches to sport often become so, but rather this serves as a call to action. We can share a message about the responsibility that comes with being an athlete, opting into the tradition, learning about and continuing the generations of work that have gone in to make sport inclusive and for all, and from there to work toward building a broader society beyond playing fields that is inclusive and for all. Maybe what has happened since June 24th on your campus has been similar to mine, maybe it has differed. But we knew we had to get to work right away to come up with a communication plan to make sure everyone who was an athlete or who worked with athletes was on the same page and fully informed about what to do to which experts to go and how to communicate. Without getting into too many details, we built this information into our mandatory Title IX training in athletics. Thinking more about the intersection of Title IX and abortion rights, it got me realizing that we can talk about the right to choose as an educational access and therefore an educational civil rights issue. For now, while we do not have a federal law to codify the right to an abortion, we do have Title IX and an ability to protect a person's right to choose, at least in an educational setting. Last month, I wrote a piece for which I spoke with Chrissy Perham, who bravely shared her college athlete abortion story in the athlete's amicus brief to the Supreme Court in Dobbs and Sarah Vaughn, who bravely became a parent while a college athlete. They both have much wisdom to share about the ways in which intercollegiate athletics departments could better serve and support athletes. Of course, this also applies to schools and their obligation to serve and support all students. Access to education, including school sports, is a civil right, and we can lean in with Title IX to make sure we are protecting athletes and students' right to choose. Unplanned pregnancies are common among college athletes. We know the right to choose keeps students in school and in school sports. Choose abortion and know that you will be supported. Choose parenthood and know that you will have university support through pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum recovery, along with sufficient resources for childcare. These things have not happened yet. We also can be teaching our students that political and civic engagement is how these things happen. One place to look for resources in a nonpartisan civics playbook is allvotenoplay.org. 
Before I hand over to Ajane, I should situate myself uh, for the purposes of this conversation. I'm a sports historian at ASU. My work is public facing and aligns with our university's mission of inclusivity and access. In the context of college sports history, I sit at the intersection of the reform push in big time college sports that has historically focused primarily on football and to a lesser degree men's basketball and women's college sports history and advocacy. I have used my story to illustrate the bifurcated nature of college sports, something I've called a Jim Crow divide and something that has become much easier to see, <laughs> um, especially after the FBI probe into the underground economy of men's basketball occurred like in tandem with the FBI probe into the side door of elite university admissions. Um, right now, <laughs> I'm hard at work coming up with a new design for college sports, one that will no longer be as dependent upon football players' money to fuel the whole enterprise. And with that, I'm going to kick it to Dr. Ajane Keaton, who is going to share, I'm sure, uh, about her important work on race, gender, and college sports. Thank you so much. Um, Y'all two going has really set me up, so I actually don't have to share my slides. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with my remarks. Um, and so as we celebrate this 50th anniversary of Title IX, I challenge us to be more succinct in our language. Yes, Title IX has increased girls' participation in sport, and it's awesome, but opportunities are stalled for girls and women of color, as we saw on the first lecture already. So in this 50th year anniversary and beyond, let's investigate what story the data have told and the story the data continue to tell us about girls and women of varying racial identities in sport. In this lecture, I have three challenges or charges for us as we consider the next 50 years of Title IX and intercollegiate athletics. First, I challenge us to investigate the story of Title IX data. To demonstrate this, I will briefly share some of my collaborative research on Black women HBCU athletes. Second, I challenge us to not only think intersectionally, but to engage with intersection, intersectionality at a level that demonstrates critical praxis, which means applying Crenshaw's framework with the intent of solving social problems. Lastly, I want us to let go of assuming other and critical stakeholder groups in sport will innately uphold the spirit of Title IX. I wanna begin with my last point, refrain from upholding the spirit of Title IX. What do I mean by this? What I mean is the spirit of Title IX in athletics embodies this desire for the sexes to have equal athletic experiences, uh, particularly related to access and opportunity. But when we focus on the spirit of Title IX, we assume all critical and ancillary stakeholders also uphold the spirit of Title IX because they are engaged with universities and athletes. They do not. Take, for example, the glaring inequities that we saw in NCAA championships in 2021. We could look at golf, softball, women's basketball. As a former Hooper, I'm gonna focus on women's basketball. But I want us to think of the fact that the NCAA hired Kaplan and Heckler to investigate their own gender inequality. And what they found in that report was that the NCAA tournament would have failed all three criteria of the Title IX three-prong test. So the fact that a critical stakeholder ignore gender equality for the sake of financial interests is why I argue we let go of simply upholding the spirit of Title IX, because doing so assumes that others will innately center the priorities and growth of women's athletics. So in this next 50 years, let us not assume that stakeholders will uphold the virtues of Title IX, but let us investigate the data to determine how Title IX is being upheld. Next, I wanna to move to my second point. The Women's and Sport Foundation in 2020 report uh, in the report stated that 4,854 Black women participated in HBCU sports, 549 white women, and 683 Asian, Latina, and Indigenous women participated in HBCU athletics. The story I take away from this data is that Black female athletes are participating in sports with girls who look like them, particularly in sports outside of track and basketball. In my 2021 collaborative piece with Dr. Joseph Cooper, published in the Journal of Negro Education, we studied the experiences of 10 female athletes attending at HBCU to better understand these experiences, particularly on the access of cultural, social, and academic experiences. A major finding of this research was learning that these Black women athletes 
were participating in their sports with this desire to feel validated and seen in their sport because they were finally able to play with rather than play against other Black females in sports outside of track and basketball. And I want to share an excerpt from one of our participants. Jackie, a swim athlete, stated, I'm on the swim team, and most people would be like, Pride University has a swim team. So to have a swim team where we're demonstrating Black people can swim, yeah, we can do anything anybody else can do. By investigating the story of Title IX data, Black female athletic experiences are simply more than athletic experiences. They are culturally uplifting experiences that allow these athletes to feel seen in sports where they are often rendered the only one. I want us to then consider how sport participation for Black female athletes is an act of resistance, particularly at HBCUs. The act of resistance, in the words of Jackie, is proving Black girls can swim. Although this study did not set out to examine Title IX, my colleague and I found that there is a deeper story behind the data. And then I want to get into my last charge, my second charge. In the next 50 years, I want us to not only think intersectionally, I want us, meaning coaches, administrators, athletes, and scholars, to put our knowledge of intersectionality into critical praxis. Collins and Blige 2020 challenge us to engage in critical praxis by using intersectionality to solve social problems. For those unfamiliar with intersectionality, it is a theoretical, methodological, or methodological and legal framework for interpreting and making sense of how identities are entangled to create disparate forms of marginalization rooted in hegemonic systems. In my recent work, I used intersectionality to examine how racial and gender identity of Black women diversity leaders in sport organizations inform their perceptions of organizational inclusivity. What I found was these leaders draw upon an unfortunate expertise that comes from their understanding of navigating the entangled systems of racism and sexism in sport organizations and society at large. So we currently have Black women DEI leaders in college sport organizations using their knowledge of intersectionality to solve the problem of organizational inclusivity in these contexts. Admittingly, before this study, I was personally fixated on how intersectionality informed my scholarship, and I solely used it to examine social problems and not solve these problems. What I took away from these Black women diversity leaders was intersectionality is more than a lens for conducting research. It's the active process of using this consciousness that comes from being attuned to entangled systems of marginalization to address organizational inequities. So to conclude, I charge us in the next 50 years of Title IX to be like contemporary Black women diversity leaders. Let's not just think intersectionally, but let's consider how we are using our knowledge of entangled systems of marginalization to solve organizational problems, particularly problems related to girls and women of color. Thank you so much. That piece is available in Frontiers Journal. And now I pass it over to Dean Bazuvis. Thanks, AJ. Uh, so for my opening remarks, I wanted to pick up a little bit um, on uh, Libby's overview um, and sort of bring it into uh, the legal sphere and talk about some of the specific uh, Title IX compliance challenges uh, that we have been seeing and that we continue to see um, play out in, uh, in courts um, and in the um, administrative enforcement realm. Um, and then to also sort of pivot from that into some of the uh, maybe predictive lens of where, uh, where compliance might uh, move from here and how we might be able to, um, to move the needle on that. Um, so, uh, you know, as Libby mentioned, uh, we have definitely seen growth in the number of opportunities for uh, both girls uh, in, in the K through 12 setting, as well as women uh, playing uh, collegiate sport. Um, but there's still a gap when it comes to women not having uh, as many opportunities as men have. Um, and actually, the problem is even worse than that, because when it comes to establishing uh, what would satisfy courts and what would satisfy the Department of Education as Title IX compliance, um, it's not a question of whether men and women have the same number of opportunities. It's whether women uh, and men who are students at a university have an equal opportunity to participate. 
Um, and so the standard that is used there is actually one of proportionality. This was added to uh, the Title IX uh, regulations when, uh, after the statute was passed, um, Department of Education's predecessor agency uh, promulgated um, a, a regulatory standard uh, that then got clarified in a policy interpretation that provided a three-part test for measuring compliance when it comes to um, uh, the number of athletic opportunities that are available at an institution. Um, and at the time, women were underrepresented in college education. So uh, male stakeholders in college sport didn't want uh, an equality standard. They didn't want 50-50. Uh, to be one of those compliance uh, op options. Um, they argued for proportionality instead um, on the theory that if uh, men were uh, the, the majority of college students, they should also have the majority of um, athletic opportunities. Well, okay, fine, but as uh, I heard Donna Lopiano once say, the shoe now pinches because <laughs> women have now become uh, the majority um, of the college student population. Um, many schools, most schools have a majority uh, female student body. And so that means to comply with the proportionality standard, it's not enough to even have equal athletic opportunities for men and women, which both, most schools don't, um, but you should actually have more opportunities for women in order to give your female student body the same rate of participation or the same level of opportunities as men. So um, in the Women's, uh, uh, Women's Sports Foundation report that came out this year on Title IX's 50th anniversary, um, it, the, the, there are um, only about 94 of the 1, 000, over 1,000 NCAA member institutions that have satisfied the proportionality test. Um, there's a, a handful of schools that actually don't comply with proportionality because they favor women, uh, and those might actually be um, colleges that were historically uh, women's institutions that have been solely trying to, uh, to shift to men. Um, and, uh, but the majority of institutions, 86% uh, percent of institutions are uh, under, women are the underrepresented sex when it comes um, to athletics. And when you add up all of those missing opportunities, the number it would take to close that gap and to ensure that women would have the same rate of participation as men, um, it's actually almost 50,000 athletic opportunities that are missing across the US, um, you know, across US higher education. Um, so, um, and, and not to make things even more dire, um, but, but the situation is possibly even worse than that um, when we consider that um, it's very likely that some of those numbers on the uh, on the women's side are over counting or inflating uh, the number of um, female athletic opportunities that an institution provides. Um, so one way that that happens is for um, institutions to um, take a sport. You know, rowing is where this is documented to happen pretty frequently. Um, you can have limitless women apparently on, um, on a collegiate women's rowing team. Uh, a study came out that, uh, of uh, USA Today over the summer uh, that found um, 80, uh, 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 37 schools had twice as many, twice as many rowers as the sort of maximum number that could participate in the conference that they were in. So you have um, you know, people who are taking up roster slots who are not actually getting um, a genuine uh, participation opportunity. Um, and so those are likely included in the numbers and it would take litigation in order to uh, sort of suss out which opportunities are real and which are not. Um, also likely included in the numbers because of some um, uh, a, a sort of quirk of regulatory compliance that when reporting on numbers of athletes on various teams for purposes of another law, uh, the EADA, Equity and Athletics Disclosure Act, um, it actually, the reporting requirements ask you to uh, include um, everyone who's participating on a team, whether they're eligible to compete or not, which results in male practice players often getting tallied as female athletes. 
Um, and I wouldn't go so far as USA Today did and say that schools are counting their male practice players um, as members of the women's team. They're following these um, uh, uh, confusing regulations that are, and reporting them as they're supposed to. Um, but the, regul the, the reporting regulations aren't keyed to Title IX. And so we don't know if internally the school is saying, okay, well, uh, we are adjusting for the fact that we've got these male practice players and still making sure that we have enough uh, women to balance out um, our athletic opportunities. Um, so when there's so when those numbers are showing up in an EAD report, they're likely getting uh, tallied into some of these um, overview statistics and is making it look like the gap is uh, even smaller than it actually is. Um, so um, you know where. What, 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 what accounts for this intractable uh, and persistent gap in athletic opportunities? Um, I think there are a variety of factors um, that would explain why institutions continue to, um, uh, you know, con have continued historically to grow their men's athletic program without first waiting for their women's athletics to, to catch up in terms of participation. Um, I think that for much of Title IX's life, there was a lot of denial about the enforceability of Title IX. Uh, for the much of the 70s and the 80s, there was um, litigation that for a while produced um, a Supreme Court decision that said that Title IX didn't apply to college athletics because athletics didn't directly receive federal funding. Um, and so while that litigation was playing out and for the period of time between when that decision came out and when Congress overruled it with um, a clarifying statute, um, there was very little incentive for institutions to comply with Title IX. And then we hit the 90s with the sort of uh, laissez-faire uh, politics when it came to the enforcement of Civil Rights Act. And again, um, colleges and institutions probably felt very little motivation to comply. Um, so this kind of allowed this unchecked growth of men's sports to continue while, um, you know, with, without trying to um, balance those opportunities for women. Uh, and then colleges turn around and notice that women have all of a sudden become the majority uh, of students on their campus and they realize that uh, they have a terrible compliance problem and they have a, a and they can't possibly um, continue to afford all of the sports that they've overextended themselves on. Uh, and they go to make a choice like uh, we must right size our athletic program, which is code for cutting teams. Um, and they might make the terrible choice to say, well, we're going to do this very even handedly and we're going to cut one men's team and one one women's team. Um, and that turns out to be a Title IX compliance problem uh, because it because if women are the underrepresented sex and you can cut equally from both sides and women will still be the underrepresented sex. Um, and what's more, there's not even a chance that an institution in that situation would be able to comply with either of the other two compliance options, um, one of which allows an institution to show compliance by a history and continuing practice of program expansion uh, for the underrepresented sex. Um, and the alternative uh, would be to that would be showing that notwithstanding a disparity of opportunities, all of the women at your college are satisfied with the meager athletic opportunities that they get. And as soon as you cut a viable women's team, you now have um, a class of women for whom uh, you can point to and say, clearly all of the women at your college are not satisfied with the disparity in athletic opportunities because these women now don't have a team. Uh, so um, some of the things that, um, you know, uh, so, so we've got the unchecked growth, uh, uh, because of reasons related to a denial about compliance, uh, misunderstanding about how um, equity works and how the three-part test would protect women's teams when they uh, when women are the underrepresented sex. Um, I think depending on what type of college and university we're talking about, um, you have um, schools that are running their athletic programs, uh, their athletic programs with a business model, um, profit seeking, um, and of course, uh, see much more um, investment potential by continuing to expand football rosters, say, um, than, um, invest, than, than allocating uh, those athletic participation opportunities to balance out uh, to balance things out in terms of gender equity. Um, and then there are schools that are not necessarily running their athletic departments as a business. Um, this might apply to schools in, in Division Three, 
Um, but because women have become the majority of college students, their athletic departments are under pressure from admissions departments to do whatever they can to attract more men to this college um, so that it doesn't become known as a college where it's you know, predominantly women and where men wouldn't want, to, um, wouldn't want to attend. So admissions departments are very concerned about the gender gap in admissions and are, are putting pressure on athletic departments to add more men's teams in order to correct that problem. But the problem with that approach is that, of course, that just keeps driving uh, the disparity even, um, even, even, even greater. So um, one thing that is um, uh, that, that we should uh, expect to try to um, address these problems, to try to close these gaps would be enforcement, legal enforcement. Um, and there are two ways that Title IX is enforced. Um, private enforcement through lawsuits, public enforcement by um, investigations by the Department of Education. Uh, Department of Education can't knock on every door and um, investigate every single um, college and, and, and university athletic department. Uh, they can at least respond to complaints that they receive. Um, so that is one viable way of enforcement. The problem with uh, relying on that as your compliance tactic is that the remedy that OCR can provide is prospective only. Um, all they can tell an institution that doesn't comply is, okay, so from, from now on, will you please comply with Title IX? <laughs> Um, which creates very little incentive for proactive compliance, and I think is partly an explanation for uh, why we're in the situation of such, um, uh, such, such, such weak compliance across the board. Um, litigation is also plausible. You need to have motivated plaintiffs. So oftentimes when we see Title IX litigation, it's because women have been, have been on the receiving end um, of uh, a, a decision to cut their team. Uh, and those women end up being very highly motivated plaintiffs and pursuing, uh, pursuing litigation. So um, both of those have weaknesses uh, in compliance. And so I think one avenue to explore is where more public um, sort of soft enforcement, where public opinion uh, can provide more pressure for compliance, kind of like it did when Title IX's application to sexual misconduct was having its moment at first. Um, more so than anything the Department of Education was saying about how institutions needed to change their, um, their disciplinary um, procedures and their policies and approaches to sexual misconduct. It was the concern and the fear of uh, looking bad in the court of public opinion um, that was driving institutions to make those changes very rapidly. Um, so I think part of our compliance strategy could be to um, of course, try, continue to try to improve access to justice and make viable plaintiffs, uh, give them the, the ammunition they need to fight these claims in court, to continue to try to tweak the enforcement standard that OCR uses and to try to give that more teeth. Uh, but then a, a third tactic um, of enlisting the public to care more about this, because we can make choices about uh, where we, which higher institutions of higher ed we choose to work at, where we choose to send our children to go to school, which teams we choose to support, where we're going to buy season tickets. Um, and I think with more, um, you know, continued awareness about that, uh, uh, about these problems and, and uh, a stronger mobilization effort, we might be able to harness that uh, effort a little more to supplement some of these other uh, enforcement weaknesses. Um, I'll leave it there in terms of uh, uh, introductory remarks. I'll turn it over to um, uh, uh, our last panelist, Dr. Aaron Whiteside. So when I was asked to think about the future of college sports for women, um, as someone who studies media, I started thinking about that question in relation to what role sports journalism and sports media will play in how we imagine the worth and value of sports women. Much of my research focuses on how that value is negotiated through the practices, logics, and norms in which women and issues central to women, including Title IX, how those uh, topics are covered and the outcomes of those practices, the coverage itself. I not only study how women's sports and Title IX are covered, but I also like to consider the context by which um, either women's sports or Title IX might receive more or more just types of coverage in um, a variety of sports media outlets. 
I chose the word seductive party, which may have been a little surprising. I chose those tongue in cheek. Um, in part because as someone who's immersed in sports media and also uh, public uh, discourse happening in social media, I'm kind of immersed, grounded in a narrative of progress and empowerment um, that are really tempting to revel in and get excited about. As my colleagues have shown, that narrative does not really match with what we know about the progress of Title IX and of course the limits of its implementation to serve the interests of a diverse group of girls and women. In my work, I have surveyed sports editors, sports writers, producers, sports information directors, um, everyone working in sports in a wide variety of uh, positions. Um, about their attitudes toward Title IX. And what I have found is that over time, um, especially this last survey uh, that I did in 2019, those attitudes have shifted in significant ways that indicate increasing support for the law and the broader concept of gender equity. I've also conducted dozens of qualitative interviews with, again, people working in all aspects of sports media about their approaches to covering women's sports, as well as Title IX. And the overwhelming sentiment is Title IX is good, we support it, it's important, and it's um, important to uh, cover uh, the law in that way. Those ideas were really on display during the 40th anniversary of Title IX, as well as the 50th. Um, after decades of the outright exclusion of women in collegiate sports, a stubborn inclination among sports media to provide critics of Title IX a visible mediated platform, um, which is still happening and uh, happened uh, in the COVID year in 2020 when um, a number of programs uh, or a number of athletic departments cut programs in certain teams. The, um, tendency was to give the coaches of the programs who were cut a voice to control the narrative. But there's been a history of that. There's also been, of course, a record of hostility and belittlement toward female athletes by sports journalists. So during those anniversaries, to see images and narratives of girls and women's sports dominate in the media felt really good. Um, if you're on social media talking uh, uh, you know, with, with fans and, and getting excited about women's sports, sometimes it can feel like we're in the middle of um, kind of a feminist empowered, empowered party. Um, and so I think it becomes very tempting for sports journalists to also throw this party, if you will, in terms of a singular focus on progress and celebration. And so what happens is that narratives of liberal feminism too often replace introspective critiques of how sporting practices may contribute to ongoing forms of harmful opp oppression that prevent increased forms of meaningful empowerment in sporting spaces. And my colleagues have already alluded to a number of those um, practices. Importantly, the narratives of empowerment that are often lifted up in public discourse and, and mediated spaces, social media, and also um, uh, sports media, sports journalism, they function via neoliberal logics to deflect attention away from wider structural and cultural conditions that sustain the very gender inequalities feminist activism, and in the case of collegiate women's athletics, Title IX has aimed to dismantle. And so I hope to share some research today on the social and mediated discourse about various feminist moments in sports to illustrate this idea. I also want to point out that we know uh, women in general are historically underrepresented in sports media. They've been subject to decades of reporting norms that render them as inferior, uninteresting, and importantly, essentially different from what is imagined as an authentic or male athlete. This assumption puts the future of women's sports and Title IX at risk. How can we possibly advocate for equity if we don't see women's sports and women as deserving of an equitable distribution of resources and opportunity. And so I think we must be very much on guard in this moment of celebratory narratives for the re-emergence of sexual difference narratives. And I hope to share today where I, uh, two places where I see that happening. Um, another point I want to mention is that uh, the coverage patterns that I alluded to in terms of either hostility towards women or um, the kind of outright ignoring of women's sports, they don't hold true anymore. 
Um, in Knoxville, I'll start with Knoxville, the Lady Vols press row is often full. ESPN is broadcasting more women's softball games this year uh, than they ever had before. And they rolled out something called the Thursday Night Throwdown, where they promoted and hyped intriguing matchups. It's worth mentioning that that kind of manufactured event is ripe for drama and intrigue, two aspects that um, when built into sports media production create an entertaining spectacle that demands audience attention. And when an organization like ESPN creates that type of event, uh, especially related to women's sports, they're setting an agenda in the wider sports landscape. They're signaling that collegiate women's sports are valuable, which is a critical need for women's sports advocates who are working for a ro more robust enforcement of Title IX and the related forward progress for a more socially just collegiate uh, landscape. It's worth noting that the expansion of league networks like the Big Ten and SEC networks are giving more visibility to women in sports and athletic departments themselves are playing a key role in marketing women's sports where so many fans hang out these days on their social media feeds. When I scroll through Instagram, the universities that I like, and I will shout out to my alma mater, Cal State Fullerton, where I play basketball. When I'm scrolling through those feeds, I see posts on women athletes. Um, and sports journalists and other sports media have responded to the rigorous critiques identifying the many ways in which historical reporting practices have undermined women's credibility in sports. As research continues to show, women's sports receive better and more just coverage in a variety of contexts than ever before. I am not suggesting there is not work to be done, especially analyses that take on intersectional perspectives, um, but we have taken a step forward. However, this is where the tempting or sedu seductive party kind of comes into play, is that the progress itself raises a challenge. If our task as communication sports scholars is to detect, do, to detect new emerging and intersecting forms of oppression, what tools should we use to do that in the most effective way? How do we judge content that appears to be in line with what we see in terms of men's sports coverage? Um, can we say that sports media has turned an ethical and socially just corner and ultimately playing a role in improving the possibilities for collegiate women's sports? Finally, sports journalists are taking on the topic of trans athletes in sports in a way that will have big, implica big implications for how we understand women in collegiate sports going forward. Transphobic legislation traffics in narratives of sexual difference, and sports journalists must reckon with how they handle this type of discourse or, or information material that they receive. I hope I'll share more in the conversation um, on this subject. Uh, and for sake of time, I'm, I'm going to skip over an example I was going to give, but I'm sure I'll be able to share later. Um, there's a lot to be excited about for the future of women in collegiate sports, but we must be cautious about the narratives of empowerment, they can be in tempting and they can divert our attention from uh, important work that can make uh, sporting spaces more socially just, inclusive and um, meaningfully empowered, empowering. I will pass it off to uh, Dr. Lovoy. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, now I more fully understand your two words of seductive party, of the feminist empowered party that's being thrown by many and especially highlighted by the media. So I would like to invite all of our um, panelists back to the screen. And wow, where do we start? <laughs> to unpack so much, so many good thoughts. I've got pages of notes. Um, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna open it up. Um, I wrote down a few quotes that I thought were particularly poignant, but I wanna have a chance for the panelists to respond and expand upon any particular thought or notion that uh, you wanted to pick up on and, and can elaborate from your perspective. So um, I can start if you don't okay, mind. AJ, why don't yeah. you kick us off? I, I want to connect the dots between what I was talking about, this notion of the spirit of Title IX. I think, Erin, it's what you were talking about, the Raha 
we always are celebrating. We just had the you know 40th, 10 years ago. The media is always making it this big event. And Livia, I want to connect to what you were talking about of like, but we're still not there yet. And so how do we get, in y'all's opinions, um, how do we get other stakeholders to see that we haven't truly atoned to what this civil rights issue was you know, meant to be and not just celebrate what we've done, but really get to the point where we've actualized the true commitment of Title IX? Yeah, Libby, do you want to pick that up? Because I think you had a comment on that. Yeah, thank you so much, AJ. Thank you to all the panelists. I think it's um, really uh, illustrative to me of how rich and uh, exciting scholarship on these issues are right now that are really asking us to, are forcing new questions for the future of um, equality framings um, and, and discussions in sport. That's really important. And I think um, one of the things that's front of mind for me is, is I think bringing into the conversation challenges to institutions that as Aaron helpfully pointed out, have really been sort of given a pass in other moments around um, Title IX compliance. And I think these comments, we could probably apply these in different ways to the comments that uh, that everyone has made. But um, but uh, but I want to especially look to the NCAA because they have been in the hot seat in the last few years. And I think that there is uh, much more that, that could be done to pressure that organization as a stakeholder with actually far more power to uh, participate in these issues than we often give them credit for, right? On the one hand, you know, Aaron um, no noted that the federal government can't go door to door and demand compliance with every institution. I mean, they could but we haven't seen them do it. But the NCAA actually makes its member institutions comply with all sorts of rules um, that that have that do not have the backing of federal law. And I think among the things that we that we want to think about are the politics of the possible, right? And what role we might be able to play in forcing some of those institutions who have been insufficient, who have been publicly called out on it and, and yet haven't responded. And so to my mind, then the question returns to, you know, how do we build the coalitions that um, that that can do that work? And the public opinion research that I've done shows that there is an extraordinary amount of support for the premise of equality in sport. And so the American public, I don't think, needs to be convinced um, in this moment that, that women are deserving by and large. I mean, certainly you have your dedicated sexists and, um, and folks who have loud voices and use social media to, to spread those messages. But when you look at the data, people are in support of this. And so the question is, right, how do we get coalitions to emerge um, on these issues? And it's a challenging task, actually, to get athletes and especially men to work as allies to this cause. Um, and so I think we need, but we need to think about that, right? And we need to think about the institutions that we're targeting to make those claims, because it is a political issue that manifests in um, a variety of social institutions, including the media um, and legal institutions as well. But uh, but I see I see that there's sort of a lot more to unpack there. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, and then uh, Victoria, I want you to pick up on that as well. Um, so Aaron, let's have let's have you go. Yeah, so I, I love how you phrased that, the spirit of Title IX and the kind of rah-rah Title IX uh, coverage that we so often see in sports media. Um, I, there's, a, I think, a couple aspects that would need to be in place in order to improve the quality and nuance of the coverage. First is uh, there, there aren't enough sports journalists that know what Title IX are. There are some. Um, and I'm just going to throw out a couple names that I think are really important. Katie Barnes, Maren Fader, Cora Hall, uh, who's in Knoxville, and Tamron Sproul. I mean, these are four uh, women that have done a phenomenal job in covering a variety of aspects of Title IX. Uh, but there's a lot in the field that, that don't, and our survey research bears that out, we don't understand Title IX, and, and certainly the, the nuanced um, ideas of the limits of its of its. Uh, effectiveness is is not something that's that's part of the ongoing conversation in sports media and so education is definitely a key piece of this and advocacy focusing on education and sports media I think would would help um, the other real quick thing I'll say is that um, you know in anniversaries anniversaries regardless of the topic tend to be really celebratory and it's a limit of journalism norms we, we like to mark that progress and then revel in that progress um, so it would take disrupting some of this some journalistic norms to produce a more thoughtful assessment of title nine at anniversaries 
a great call to action for the 60th anniversary of Title IX. Maybe we'll just start small with the 51st anniversary and see if we can push some change. Uh, Victoria, do you want to pick up on that? Sure, I, I think um, Libby's point about kind of putting pressure on the NCAA to do the job, job of what it isn't, but what it could be, which is a, a governing body. Um, you know, it's a membership association, which allows it to kind of hide behind home rule, which is why we haven't had guiding enforceable principles around all sorts of things that easily could have been done like a protocol for summer workouts and heat stroke. Um, we've had football players die from that, like Jordan McNair at the University of Maryland, like a protocol for when there's racist verbal abuse at sporting events, like what we saw with Duke at BYU and the volleyball team there and what had happened to Rachel Richardson. Um, and then the, the kind of messy fallout from that would have been prevented too, because other sports governing bodies, you stop. <laughs> You identify the person, you know, who is responsible for that speech, you remove them. Um, if it happens again, you stop again. Like this is a common thing in sport. And so what this, this gets to also is um, a broader tension that's, that's, you know, these are educational programs. This is an educational nonprofit, but it's also kind of been given the green light from university presidents to be run like a 21st century sports business. And as a result of that, the money has just dramatically exploded, especially in the last 20 years. Um, but, you know, at the very top of this, if we're talking about the power five conferences and the top 65 football programs or so, that money doubled in five years that the power five has. Um, the five years from the launch of the college football playoff to the eve of the pandemic. Um, and I think part of what we would be wise to do as advocates for women's, co women's college sports is to be very aware of the current moment that we're in. Um, and if we're talking about equity and access and civil rights, football players are, are not getting the education that they deserve. Um, I don't mean to pick on Dr. Whiteside. I had looked this up <laughs> for a talk I was giving with my historian colleagues. Um, and I thought a really illustrative example of this tension was the crowdfunding the University of Tennessee did after their goalposts came down. Um, the University of Tennessee is a top 20 revenue generating program. They bring in about $150 million a year in revenue. Um, but the business model, you have to spend it, right? Um, you, you have to spend it or else it looks like something else. And so, um, you know, they didn't have the resources to have goalposts ready for their game only a week later. And I looked into um, the data from Dr. Sean Harper at USC in the Race Equity Center that he runs there. Less than half of um, black football players and basketball players at Tennessee are graduating. And so, like that's supposed to be the trade off here right that you're getting a world class academic and athletic experience well many of us are and oftentimes it's um you know t talking about what ajane was talking about it's often white women from suburban high schools that have resources to have water polo and lacrosse and field hockey and and the sports and the access that not all schools have in the united states we're often the beneficiaries of this so you know, with with changes that are inevitably coming, um, there are antitrust challenges continuing um, and women athletes are named plaintiffs in some of those too. Um, I think it would be uh, it would behoove us to start thinking about alternative subsidization models for women's sport because this is an educational setting. So those civil rights laws and those access and equity um, requirements will still be in place going forward. I didn't mean to take this into a different direction, but um, I, I hope that's what you were, um, you know, asking of me, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting because I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A here and our colleague, Dr. Nancy Lowe from UNLV, which some of you may know, um, you know, we're all educators, everyone on this screen. We're in the institution of higher ed. And so I'm wondering, 
to Libby's point about coalition building and creating change and Aaron, you know, educating future sport journalists to cover sport more equitably and, and not perpetuating um, empowerment and celebratory narratives to sport management students around diversity and equity, inclusion and belongingness to legal students to, you know, all the students we teach at what point do we as educators have to take responsibility for the success or the failures of what's happening? I, I'm just posing that. I thought that was a really interesting comment. So, um, so how do, I mean, what is the solution, right? So we, we can critique, we're all great at critiques and I think we've offered up some solutions, but um, where might else we land to change the system? Um, does anybody want to pick that up? Well, well, I mean, there's definitely not one answer, but uh, I think I think one one piece of it could be looking at uh, key stakeholders within higher ed. Um, obviously, university presidents have an enormous, um, you know, ha have enormous power. And I mean, they're kind of, I think I need to put them in the same box as the NCAA, which is like, you could do a lot more <laughs> than you're doing. And you're a real disappointment uh, that, <laughs> that you haven't stepped up. So, I mean, I, I think we need to call them out as well um, you know, for that same, for that same reason. And then on the other uh, on the other side of the spectrum, people who are doing a lot but don't have a lot of power within university um, are Title IX coordinators. So this has been a, a, a pro, there has been a proliferation in the last decade. Um, finally, right, this has always been a regulatory requirement um, that there be an identifiable individual at your institution who is responsible for Title IX compliance and who whose name is available on the website or before there were websites in some comparable form. Um, and it really has only been in the last decade that um, institutions have taken that requirement seriously. Um, and so there are entire there are people whose entire jobs at an institution. Um, revolve around Title IX compliance. They have Title IX in their title. Um, for the most part, um, these uh, uh, these administrators have been focused on the sexual misconduct side of Title IX. Um, but I think as um, that cadre of people gets more experience, they're not all brand new anymore, um, as they were sort of at the beginning of this wave. Um, I think as hopefully there's going to eventually be some kind of political stasis in the regulatory requirements. I think we'll always have some flip-flopping back and forth between Republican and Democrat administrations. That's how a lot of administrative law works, but um, we might see at least um, some additional capacity on the part of these offices uh, to provide more oversight to their athletic department. So whenever I have an audience with Title IX administrators, um, I use it to make the plug that um, you know at your work with your you know your work on sexual misconduct is exceedingly important and affects um, students across the campus whether they're athletes or not athletes. So that's I mean that's 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 critical. Um, that is an athletics access issue that they're already working on. Um, but in in addition to that, um, to not seed or take for or to, to take on faith that whoever you think is working on that in athletics is actually doing it right, actually has the Title IX literacy um, and is, um, you know, look, looking in the, looking under the right rocks, um, noticing the right red flags. Um, and so I think that's another, uh, another office within higher education, I think, that if we can't mobilize university presidents to use their power, there are people with less power who actually would be a lot more um, on board for this kind of work. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. AJ? Yeah, I think that's, um, you know, Aaron's points really connect to my research right now, looking at these uh, new positions in athletic departments, um, athletic diversity and inclusion officers. I refer to them as ADIOs because they expand now to professional sport. Um, so athletic diversity and inclusion officers. But if y'all have noticed and, and been keen to these position adoptions, we see justice in the title. We see equity in the title. We see diversity. And so with my research, you know, I found that these leaders are attentive to gender inequities, racial inequities, um, inequities on a plethora of axes, 
but to the point of the power and opportunity, um, I'm not saying that it's a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of what is my actual job. And so when we think about just chief diversity officers in higher education, you know, they're tasked to create more equitable conditions, but that comes with disruption. And if we're looking at collegiate athletics departments, do they want this internal agitator? Do they want this internal disruptor? And right now, no. <laughs> and so when we're thinking about people outside of the athletic department, I think Title IX coordinators, you know, I would love to see that, you know, more power be bestowed upon them. But when I'm thinking about not just SWAs anymore, but again, hired officials who are formally tasked with creating more equity, I want us to think about how are they disrupting in that space and not just thinking about the hot topic issues of affinity groups and NIL, but really centering gender equity. And AJ, I want to build on that because I, I was reading your piece on the ADIOs and how it's a new position, but it's often filled by Black men or women. And so they're having to take up that important and hard work within a system where they're already perhaps marginalized to begin with, um, which seems sort of like this paradoxical it's a conundrum. Um, it goes back to your, yeah. your word paradox. Yeah, 100%. And so what's fascinating is we've hired individuals who themselves have told us for years they do not have inclusivity. Um, and for years they've been trying to push and push, but now we've tasked them to say, okay, now you're in this formal position where your push should be heard and felt, and that's not the case yet. I think um, what makes this position fascinating when we think about the next 50 years of intercollegiate athletics is they're using their own marginalization to conceptualize organization, organizational inclusivity. So on one hand, they're saying, I am in the best position to know what inequity looks like in collegiate athletics, and let me use those experiences as a barometer of expertise to fix the system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm still not, still processing that myself when I had that finding. Um, I were allowed to cuss, I was like, oh shit, I don't know if, if I feel good about that. Um, but that's what the data shows. And so again, because um, in my work, this the intersection of race and gender, they're very much so attuned to gender systems, I would say, particularly even the men. And so I'm curious how they will become critical stakeholders and disruptors in Title IX. Hmm. Thanks, AJ. It's really interesting work. And I would, for everyone listening in, um, go into Google Scholar and put these women's names into Google Scholar or whatever, you know, system you use because there's so much great work to read, to go more in depth on each one of their um, areas of expertise. Uh, I have an interesting question um, from a former Tucker Center summer intern, summer gender equity intern. Um, so let me see what you all think about this. So we're talking about the celebratory narratives that um, Dr. Whiteside teed up for us. And I have many of these shirts in my closet right now, but on the shirts that's like celebrating 50 years of Title IX and NCAA championships, I mean, I probably could go pull a couple out of the Tucker Center closet right now. Um, and so the athletes that get these shirts, then that's the narrative they take up which is sort of laughable given what happened at the NCAA women's basketball tournament. And I know we're, we're in the process of fixing those inequities. Um, but how do we counter these celebratory narratives without seeming like grumpy? <laughs> Aaron? There's a term that we teach in um, media and cultural studies called culture jamming. And it's the idea of taking um, a commonly recognized brand or narrative and redirecting it in ways that um, draw attention to uh, you know, some sort of injustice. And so maybe it's as simple as wearing that shirt in a space that illustrates that type of inequity. Um, yeah, I could just imagine like the Sedona Prince uh, video, you know, really, hey, I'm at the, I'm at, um, 
this you know major event but look what's behind me like to, to show the juxtaposition of mm. the narrative of empowerment versus what's actually on the ground it may take be creative and um you know kind of use social media in ways to to um perhaps highlight some of that and redirect the narrative love it we have two hashtags in the tucker center that we'd love for all of you to take up one is here's proof so anytime you see proof of interest in women's sport, whether it's a full stadium, a sold out something, sold out gear, fans in the stands, data going through the roof, you can just post it and say, here's proof with a hashtag. And the second one is anytime you see disruptions in the system, which is what we're talking about here, we have a disruptors, H-E-R-S, disruptors hashtag. So that's another way to draw attention to these counter celebratory empowerment narratives. Um, and, and we can also embrace our feminist killjoy selves as well. So I'm okay with that. Libby. Yeah, you know, I, I think this is a great uh, discussion. And one of the things that, one of the places that I start um, with your question, Nicole, is that actually when you, when you talk to athletes, um, women athletes, they they know that they're being treated differently than the men like there's a, a, a significant amount of um, call it indigenous knowledge among athletes about the status of inequality and so the so so i think and like the, the sedona prince example is great because it didn't nobody had to sit sedona prince down and say when you saw that pile of dumbbells you were being treated differently than the men i mean she was fired up like ready to go and i think this is in part about like creating the space um for athletes to um to to share that knowledge and also i think again to into ensure and to think critically about the ways in which that experience is born um it, it is born unequally by participants on women's teams in ways that often the men never have to confront and see. Now we could sort of pull apart the differences between men participating on different types of men's sports. Um, but one of, the, one of the projects that I'm working on right now that I alluded to um, in my book manuscript actually surveyed college athletes, college coaches and um, athletic administrators. And among the things that we found is that, is that men who participate in training and competitive opportunities where they spend more time with women athletes, which is a small percentage of the overall college athletic population actually know and understand quite a bit more about how inequality is functioning and is being born unequally on the backs of women's experiences than do the men who are largely sequestered and allowed to participate you know, in sex segregated environments where they never see women and maybe they go to their football training facility that's built by, you know, for them and only them and women may or may not even train in that environment. Um, and those coalitions, I think, are really that knowledge breach um, and that gap between how that information is shared is, is, I think, one of the conclusions of my research, a key problem in this coalition um, conundrum. And so, so I, I want to sort of have us think about what that means, how structures are, are, are ensuring that those conversations aren't happening, but also to, I think, you know, to come back to another sort of common feminist call, we can trust the women. So how can we get uh, more space for athletes to not feel uh, uh, secluded in their experiences with discrimination and not to have to wait for the plaintiff that has the money to pursue the court case or the knowledge to pursue the OCR claim? You know, it, this there there's just, there's a lot more potential there that is untapped. And um, I think we have to think critically about the institution and the institutional structures that need to change, um, which of course they're not gonna want to, right? Like college athletic administrators don't want a bunch of women rising up and saying, how dare you? They don't want that, right? But this is power, this is politics, this is this is the struggle that we're in. And so I think we need to name that um, in order to claim it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Libby. Agree. Does anyone want to piggyback on that? I think, um, yeah, thanks. Libby, connected to that, I've been thinking about how unbelievably proud I've been lately. Um, and this is actually related to my two words, the fix and fit. How proud I've been lately of athletes um, and athletes in women's sports in particular for creating a broader culture change in what we think good coaching is. Um, and this is happening in the collegiate space and it's happening elsewhere too. 
Um, but recognizing that practices that were harmful weren't good coaching um, and being brave to call it out and to come together with teammates to refuse um, to have to be in a position where it's like you are enduring something that is bad and doing well at your sport despite it <laughs> um, rather than being coached. Um, and, you know, all of the coaches we've been, I mean, there's been such a, <laughs> such a, just a wave of coaches being forced out by athletes across the country, I think, especially in the collegiate space. Um, I've been really proud of athletes for recognizing and leading on that. And it's, it's had a result in men's sports too. It's created a space for athletes in men's sports to recognize that they have been subjected to bad coaching called coaching that's abuse and harm um, and they can call it out also. So um, that I think gives me much hope for um, the political awareness that we're seeing among this generation. And I, I feel for them because we're in a moment that's incredibly challenging in so many different ways. <laughs> um, and you know, our current seniors were freshmen, uh, first years, when, um, you know, everything stopped in the spring of 2020. And for them to, to still be able to find their power and call things out is um, just really admirable. So I want to acknowledge and, and celebrate those athletes for doing something that's, that's really, really hard. Yeah, I would I would um, concur with that, Victoria, and push back a little bit. Not that the current generation isn't politically savvy and aware and um, embracing their activism, but I think that for some athletes who are complaining about bad coaching, that is happening. For others, I fear, and I want us to think about this, is that especially for young women, who internalize gender bias, homophobia, and racism, and the intersectionality of that is that when they are complaining about coaches, that they're unaware that some of that pushback against coaching practices might be layered in, in things that aren't bad coaching. And I'm not saying all of that, but I think there's a range of things happening in college athletics right now some of it is just, and some of it, I think it troubles me um, to some extent. So I wanna make sure I sort of counter that um, as well. So um, colleagues, we have two minutes left already. Um, so much to talk about, so little time, so much wisdom. So instead of asking everybody to end with what's the future of college athletics, which I would, we could do a whole nother distinguished lecture about this topic. If I could ask everybody, so we started with two words. I have them all written down if you need a reminder, but would you stick with your same two words or do you wanna end with a different two words? And I will, um, let's go in reverse order this time. So uh, Aaron Whiteside, what are your two words you wanna end with? Oh gosh, okay. Um, I'm gonna um, lift up women. The women that cover Title IX and women's sports that makes such a difference in how we understand the value of women's sports. Lift them up. Sorry, it's more than two words. Lift them up, retweet them, get their work out there. And um, so retweet them. Maybe those, that'll be my two words. Okay, retweet them. Love it. We always, we're starting out with a rule buster right away. Two words and we have a call to action. I love it. Okay, let's see. Um, Libby. Okay, uh, uh, part, of, part of me wants to stick with where I have, but I know I know equality unfulfilled is a downer. And so so actually picking up on some of the sort of, well, it's a downer, but it's an important downer. Um, I, I think that mine, mine actually come back to the sort of threads around um, 
coalition building, but also coalition across institutions. So I'm going to say solidarity forever um, to pick up on a sort of union call, because I think we need that. Um, we need that. We need that for the movement politics of the future. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, AJ. I am going to end with critical praxis. Um, I think, you know, in these lecture series, I'm not the first one to bring up intersectionality. And I think with um, our scholarship, I would like to see more intersectional research, um, particularly looking at the power dynamics of race and gender, not just for historically racialized minority groups, but also white females in sport. Like what does their dominant and marginalized identity do for their experiences in sport and particularly in administration? Thank you. Victoria. And this is tough, Nicole. Um, I, <laughs> I like my fixing shit. Um, <laughs> how about finding joy? Oh, love that. that. That's a big spectrum for where you started. <laughs> And I think that's the duality of our work, right? It can be both <laughs> and, it's paradoxical. That's where in that paradoxical space is where we try to create change. Um, Aaron. Uh, I'll add public pressure uh, to my two word list um, just to uh, encapsulate my comments before about some of the limits of relying on the law itself to solve these problems. Great, thank you. And I, I guess um, I, I didn't put my own self in our alphabetical order, but um, as the moderator, I will end. So my two words would be accelerate change. And that's a call to action for everybody on the screen who's listening in, who will watch it in the future. What is your role? What is your passion for accelerating change, systems change for girls and women in sport? So I. Thank our panelists, your amazing women. I appreciate all, appreciate all of you. And I look forward to a time where I can give you all a, a big hug and talk to you in person. And for those tuning in, thank you so much. And this recording will live at tuckercenter.org and be available with captions for accessibility within the next couple of days. So thank you. Um, as always, give yourself grace, use data to tell the story and always support others. So thank you. <laughs>